So I wanted to just quickly review some of the material from this week and then a uh, quick preview of stuff for next week that includes um, some homework questions. Um, if you want to skip ahead to the stuff for next week, I'll put the timestamp for that right up there. Um, so we've talked a lot about stress and the various aspects of stress, including um, uh, cortisol and cortisol feedback. Um, cortisol feedback alterations are one of the main common sources of um, risk alleles for major depressive disorder and anxiety disorder. And cortisol feedback dysregulation is common in major depressive disorder and anxiety disorders. So stress externally or internally can come from the cerebral cortex or from the external stimuli and feeds into the amygdala, which then will excite the hypothalamus. Um, that then causes CRH, also known as CRF, to be released. <laughs> <coughs> and that then um, activates the anterior pituitary to release ACTH, adrenal corticotropic factor, adrenal corticotropic hormone. That travels throughout the body but only binds to the adrenal cortex, where then cortisol is released out throughout the whole body. It, cortisol in the body causes release of glucose, um, increased muscle excitability, and decreased immune function, and a few other things to sort of prepare the body for um, action. Um, the cortisol also goes into the brain and can affect cognitive perceptions of emotion and cognitive perceptions of stress in the singular cortex. You okay, man? Can you take that over to the other side, please? Oh, I can get you fresh in a minute, okay? Um... Also, sorry about that. That was a, a quick interruption from Harry Potter and uh, and my uh, um, and my son. Um, so, um, in addition to that, uh, the cortisol inhibits the hypothalamus, which then leads to a negative feedback, decreased production of cortisol. That's a self-regulatory mechanism. There's also a positive feedback system, which um, is important for keeping um, cortisol levels from dropping too quickly but is risky because positive feedback by itself can lead to excess cortisol production. Um, and that happens by the cortisol exciting the amygdala, which then will turn up more glutamate and more activation in the um, anterior, uh, in the, in the, in the um, PVN of the hypothalamus. In addition, there's a second negative feedback system that goes through the hippocampus where cortisol excites the hippocampus and then the hippocampus inhibits the hypothalamus. So there's two negative feedback mechanisms and one positive feedback mechanism, which means negative feedback usually wins out. Um, although there is some sustained signal because of the amygdala wall. Um, so we talked about um, the HPA axis and sort of the definitions of different things. Um, it has some interactions with the sympathetic nervous system, um, and but there is a separate and parallel pathway, um, which was something that we talked about before. Um, although actually, interestingly, also part of the adrenal glands, the deep medulla of the adrenal glands is where epinephrine is released. But what we talked about in terms of like a collection of research articles is how can we probe whether negative feedback is working? Um, how well does negative feedback work in controls versus major depressive disorder patients? So we have controls and major depressive disorder patients. We're going to measure their cortisol levels over the course of a day um, before doing anything and then inject this dexamethasone, which is an artificial cortisol um, mimic, an agonist that activates cortisol receptors, and then measure cortisol levels the next day. Um, in the controls, there is very strong negative feedback. So when we have a large dose of dexamethasone, then um, then that causes um, uh, the system to completely shut down the um, the uh, cortisol production. That tells us that in general, negative feedback is stronger than positive feedback um, in control subjects. Um, that's true as well in, in major depressive disorder patients because there is um, uh, some loss of uh, cortisol. Um, some decrease in cortisol after the dexamethasone, um, but um, that negative feedback is not as strong. And so that tells us that maybe one of the problems with major depressive disorder is a dysfunction in negative feedback. We'll talk more about that, especially in terms of like smaller hippocampus, which is, again, part of the negative feedback system. Um, at the beginning of class today, we talked about thyroid hormone, not because thyroid hormone is critical for any of this, um, although it can, thyroid problems can sometimes mimic depression and loss of energy, um, but because it's just another way to think about negative feedback and to make sure that everyone has a good handle on negative feedback. Um, uh, so we talked about how we could use um, something that's very similar where we have a thyroid mimic to test whether a control subject and then a patient, or control subject and then a patient with excess cortisol 
might have either a negative feedback deficit causing the excess cortisol or some other problem, maybe an overgrown thyroid that's causing the excess thyroid hormone. So the excess thyroid hormone could be either because of a negative feedback deficit, which is what we often see in depression with cortisol, or it can be because of overgrown thyroid, um, which is not something we see in uh, an analog for in depression typically. Um, but uh, although there is Cushing's, but anyway, um, um, but instead, um, what we see is um, uh, uh, other uh, is is that it is possible in endocrine systems in general to have other reasons to have excess things where negative feedback is intact. In which case, our test would give us a different result. <coughs> we can. We also spend a little while talking about sleep in major depressive disorder, and and one interesting thing that's sort of relevant for other diseases and strokes, um, and an interesting aspect of neurophysiology um, that you should know about, um, even though there weren't slides about it, is um, the role of serotonin in the raphe nucleus in shutting off the pons during REM sleep in particular, which. Um, is not what goes wrong with sleepwalking. Sleepwalking is actually during like stage one and stage two sleep typically. Um, uh, so there are different, more complicated situations going on. But um, but there are specific sort of uh, uh, things that are somewhat similar to uh, uh, acting out dreams that can happen with um, uh, with uh, deficits in this system. Or if the system stays on when you wake up, then you can end up with what's called sleep paralysis, where your pons is still shut down and you can't move when you're awake. Um, people will, that is often scary, but people will actually recover uh, uh, within a few minutes and be able to move again. Um, what is not easy to recover from is a stroke that damages the pons. Um, this can cause temporary or permanent locked-in syndrome, where um, actually the eyes are the only thing that can move, which is why we have rapid eye movement during dreaming. Um, but, uh, but with um, locked-in syndrome, um, pons is damaged, all outgoing motor paths except eye movements um, are shut down, but the patient is otherwise, um, uh, their brain is functioning totally normally, um, but it can be difficult and it can be even mistaken for being brain dead um, or, um, or in a coma. But um, in fact, they are conscious, they just can't move except their eyes. Um, this is something that doctors now know to look for, although uh, 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 years ago it wasn't uh, as much. We then talked about something sort of different, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor is neurotrophic factors in general stimulate the growth of axons and synapses and prevent axons, synapses, and neurons from being removed or dying. <coughs> so this is a backward signal. When you have um, two cells that fire together, um, synapses can get stronger because of more receptors on the postsynaptic side. That's something that you can learn about in other classes. But another thing that keeps functionally important synapses together is a backward signal from the receiving postsynaptic cell to the sending presynaptic axon of brain-derived neurotrophic factor. That signal then tells the axon to keep that branch, keep that connection, and also that this cell should be kept. During development, um, about half of the neurons that you're born with die, and that's because not all of them are making useful connections. Also, even in adults, the hippocampus continues to have new neurons being born. And the determining factor for whether new neurons that are born stay in the hippocampus or die um, is largely related to the activity of brain-derived neurotrophic factor and whether these neurons integrate into the hippocampal circuit in a meaningful way that they get a lot of PDNF signal. Um, we're going to talk at the beginning of class next time about what happens maybe to the number of surviving and newborn neurons if there's deficits in brain-derived neurotrophic factor. <coughs> The, um, the one other thing that we talked about is relating back to some of the stuff with addiction. So um, this was in particular with the paper by Holly um, from 2016. Um, and in this uh, research article, um, uh, well, first of all, in one other branch to this whole complicated circuit involving the amygdala and hippocampus and so on, is that the amygdala also releases, releases CRH, which is also called CRF, onto the ventral tegmental area. Um, what the Holly paper discovered is that if you have animals that are in a stressful situation, um, first of all, animals in a stressful situation are more prone to later become more heavily addicted to consumption of cocaine. But if you um, block CRF receptors in the ventral tegmental area, then 
those same animals or otherwise identical animals will um, after stress not have an increase and maybe even a slight decrease in the likelihood of being addicted to cocaine. Um, there are a lot of challenges in translating this to clinical use, um, uh, including, um, you know, the value of a prophylactic, uh, a potential prophylactic treatment, because this has to be given during the stress, not once somebody's become addicted, um, and whether it's meaningful and useful to do prophylactic psychiatric treatments, um, which are typically controversial at best, um, and also the fact that a pill that blocks CRF receptors um, would completely alter the um, HPA axis function because, um, of course, the amygdala is only one place, the amygdala to the, to the um, VTA is only one place where you see, um, where you see receptors um, for, uh, for CRF. The main place where we see receptors for CRF is at the anterior pituitary. And so if we just give somebody a pill that blocks CRF receptors, that would completely screw up the cortisol system and you do need cortisol to be able to wake up and function and so on and so forth. A um, couple other things to note is that um, you know, these spikes in cortisol at random times are correlated with waking up at random times or often waking up in depression, and that can lead to hypersomnia. Um, also, another cause of hypersomnia and depression um, can just be um, emotional uh, overload associated with major depressive disorder um, can lead to physiological changes not related to cortisol but related to other things that make it um, exceptionally difficult or in some cases even legitimately um, unreasonable to expect somebody to be able to um, uh, wake up and have a normal day after uh, while they're in the middle of a major depressive episode. Next time, what we're going to be talking about is um, there are ways to measure in the hippocampus in mice whether how many neurons um, are newborn neurons. So we talked about how there are newborn neurons in the hippocampus. There are ways to measure how many neurons are newborn in the hippocampus. Um, uh, there's a particular dye that we can inject, which will only be absorbed by newborn neurons that have recently undergone, my, undergone mitosis, undergone cell division. Um, and, um, and, that, um, uh, and that newborn neuron uh, measurement, it turns out if we give if we check to see in control animals how many newborn neurons are born uh, in the hippocampus over a period of about a week, um, there's about 5,000 newborn neurons. Um, if we give animals Prozac, fluoxetine, for one day or five days, there's not a big change in that. But after two to four weeks of Prozac, the animals have more increase, uh, an increase in the new number of newborn neurons. We're going to talk about that. And one of the questions on the homework is going to ask you to think about how that might relate to um, major depressive disorder and um, hippocampal size in major depressive disorder and how this might be a separate explanation independent of what we've talked about before with serotonin receptor types for why fluoxetine is um, an effective antidepressant and why it takes several weeks before it becomes effective. So that'll be coming up on Tuesday, but also you get a preview of that and some questions about it.